dickhead, you got shanked up, you pussy, look at your back. In 2019, knife crime in London has increased by 80% than in 2014, with over 43,500 knife-related offences. It has a long serrated blade and is increasingly popular on Britain's inner city streets. It's all about keeping knife crime at the centre of our national conversation. Police numbers are being slashed even as the knives pile up. Oh my God. Uh, when there, there are oh further cuts God, made to councils, to youth services, to our police, it means every day another young person potentially Justice losing their life. Three 17-year-olds were killed. A boy of 16 found dying on the estate. Knife crime is now one of the greatest challenges facing police forces across the country. In fact, the knife is Britain's number one murder weapon. In recent years, there's been a spike in knife-related incidents in the UK. Little is heard about those who are left behind to cope with the tragic loss of family members. The real implications of violent deaths are rarely voiced, and little has been heard from those touched by the tragedy. In East London, an organisation formed by Courtney Barrett called Binning Knives Saves Lives works closely with the community, using knife amnesty bins to get these deadly weapons off the streets. All right, guys, we're in Leighton Stone on Catwa Estate, where gangs are known to reside. We're going door to door, trying to get as many knives out of circulation as possible and spread as much awareness as possible. This is Leighton Stone in East London, yeah? Last week, for example, we was out for four hours. We collected 61 knives. The week before, we was out for four hours. We collected 102 knives. I think everyone should feel less safe at the moment. We're living in a very unsafe environment in a society now. There's all kinds of people carrying weapons. The media highlight the use when it comes to crime and knife crime, but the facts are most knife crimes committed by over 18-year-olds. When the police do a knife arch outside a train station, for example, you wouldn't believe the people that are carrying knives. We need more police officers. The police, can, the few police that you see around can only do so much. It's part of what the reason why we've got to this stage in our society. We definitely need more police. As you can see on my T-shirt, more police, less knives. Critics say cutbacks in police numbers have left many neighbourhoods at risk. Joseph Cullimore was stabbed in the chest by a 16-year-old with a history of mental illness, and he died of his injuries. Joseph's mother recalls the dreadful day her son was murdered. My son was visiting a friend and he left his tobacco and his phone behind. He saw the light in the flat still, so he went back, knocked at the door to get his backy and his phone. And he never came out. His friend's son killed him. He was strangled, he was beaten around the head. And as he lay dying on the floor, we understand, according to the boy's statement, that he decided to get a knife and finish him off and put him out of his misery. He actually said that voices in his head told him, as Joe had left the house, you should have killed him. That's, that's basically all we know about what happened in the flat. You don't expect to knock at the door at five o'clock in the morning and telling you your son had been murdered, unless you ran the corner from where he lived. I'm angry that you know, he's gone, he's devastated the whole family, and he's got six years for it. He got six years, which means he would be out in three. He would not talk to the psychiatrists. He was in a high security mental hospital for nine months. And then obviously, because the judge had no proof that he had any mental health issues, he sent him to um, a young offenders thing. And it, it was assessed that he'd come back to high to medium risk to do it again. And I'm sure he will, because he was so cold and callous about the whole situation and in court, he just laughed the whole time. Mum, someone sold me a lie. The streets are not home. These were just a few of the words written by Margaret Bankhole's son in her book called My Story. She's a practicing barrister who works closely with the families of victims. She helps heal them emotionally and overcome their traumatic experiences. The book's called My Story, but then is it really my story? So that kind of intrigues people. Am I talking about myself? Am I talking about my son? Uh, one of my sons developed a family outside his normal family. His family was on the streets and they became more important to him than his uh, natural family. He uh, followed his friends, so, or he was a part of what his friends were doing. And it meant that we were going down the road to his friend's house, because his friend lived down the road. 
and there will be nine or more boys in his friend's house. And then we were going a bit further to the police station and then to court. And then he ended up in the highest court of the land. So uh, he got stabbed and then he was sent to prison. So that kind of shook me because I didn't expect that to happen. So um, I said to my husband, I'm going to write a book because I was going through a lot of pain, a lot of trauma. The whole family was going through a lot of pain and trauma. And the book was kind of therapeutic because I was saying to God, all this pain can't be for me. And he said, no, it's so that you can understand what the young boys are going through. Councillor Meti Koban is frustrated with what appears to be the unstoppable epidemic of knife crime and says the government and police have to do more. So I think there's a systematic change that needs to happen. So in terms of what the council or the government or you know, the mayor of London needs to do, it needs to be really putting more money back into uh, to youth services. And this is me getting a bit political, but the government since 2010 has shut down more than 600 youth centres across the UK, um, has shut down a lot of, you know, has removed a lot of uh, youth provision away from sort of people that need it most. So the problem that you have now is, is that you've got this big growing social problem but you haven't got enough money to actually deal with it. I could have easily ended up uh, as one of those young people too. I was brought up next to Pembury Estate, which was known as one of the most uh, worst gangs uh, in London. Um, so I don't think there's any excuse for carrying a knife. I think you've got to think about your family, your future, and ultimately you're responsible for your decisions. But as I said earlier, I think you know, that's the easy thing to say. I think there is a wider systematic uh, problem around poverty linked to knife crime. With cuts in government spending, it's clear the police lack the resources to combat the ongoing surge of knife crime. In London alone, I think in 2017, there were 87 uh, fatal stabbings. In 2018, uh, there were 77 fatal stabbings. And again, Southwark and this time Hackney were high crime areas uh, involving uh, knife incidents. This year, 2019, in London, there's been over 110 incidents involving knives and more than half of them have already become fatal stabbings. So um, at the moment, statistics show it's fluctuating and hopefully it will come down. A few years ago, uh, Metropolitan Police went through a massive cost-cutting exercise, so it meant that any premises, any police premises that involved high risk, high cost maintenance, they were subsequently closed down. So where some boroughs had somewhere in the region of two to three police stations, now uh, every borough has at least one police station. Start at the top and go down, yeah. Got another road down here as well. Thank you, that's good man. It all goes right. towards good cause. Thank you. Okay, the pin's over there, so I'm gonna stick it in my jacket to get over there. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers my man, take care, stay safe, yeah. Cool. Now we're making our way to Langthorne Park. We're gonna search the park for any weapons. You know, a lot of kids hide their knives in parks and certain places now, so we go around parks sometimes looking for knives. If they feel like they need it, they know where to go and get it instead of carrying a knife on them. The psychological consequences of knife-related incidents can be distressing for all. All too often those left behind struggle to come to terms with the loss of a loved one in such violent circumstances. There are many families in trauma and it's like, it's become like a norm. So people are just turning the page. It's not affecting them in the way that it should do. You know, trauma is subjective and, you know, society needs to look at this not only must we do something, we must do something now. It's not healthy to have so many people traumatised. The only time you see them on TV is when they're crying. And then the cameras move away from that family. But that family is living that trauma for years. Everyone connected with a child that dies or goes into prison is living with trauma. I think if they could take these young people aside and speak to them one to one, about what they've seen, how they're feeling, why they feel they need to carry a knife. Is it going to bring back their lost friend? And then get a group of them together and go through the same exercise. And then get their parents together with them to understand what they're going through. Then maybe we could crack this thing. Maybe we can bring an end to young people dying on these streets. So about two months ago, I 
I came across an incident in Stratford where I saw young black boys being um, targeted for, for stop search. Um, we have something called Section 60, so when there is an incident in an area, it means that the police can carry out um, stop and search on their discretion. In that particular incident that I saw in Stratford, uh, it was like the third time they back-to-back -back stopped uh, young black boys. Um, so I went up to them to ask them, you know, what was the reason for them to stop these boys? And they were saying to me, you know, that they feel like they, they need to stop people getting stabbed, so that's why they're stopping and searching uh, these people specifically, which I thought was, of course, ridiculous because, you know, that's assuming that every single young black person is likely to commit crime. Um, so I put out a tweet about it, which went uh, quite viral, and, of course, like, I got a lot of abuse for it because a lot of people um, believe that, you know, we should have more stop and search that in order to stop and I crime, I think that you know, stop and search can be extremely dangerous in really eroding that community trust. And I don't think that that's the answer to stopping knife crime. What should happen really is there should be more diverse police officers from those communities who those communities can actually trust. Um, so when there are like sort of there is a conversation, they don't feel like they're being targeted. Four of you, four of you for a minor. Oh come on, man! That was a white, that was a white boy. That wouldn't be happening. I don't care what you don't got to say. Obviously, the public feel that powers like stop and search may be used disproportionately. Um, however, generally in the police force, it's a very important tool uh, for us to use in finding things like pro prohibited items such as knives or weapons uh, or even drugs. In spite of these efforts, people are still dying. And for some, the scars of loss are too deep to heal. I do have reoccurring nightmares about him coming knocking at my door when he gets out. But that's just in my mind. That's just my mind playing tricks, I think. But I don't feel any less safe, no. It never happened on the estate before. You know, the whole estate just went into shutdown when it happened because Joe was such a lively, loud person. We don't feel we've got justice. So this thing came into my head that we should do the petition about Joe's law old enough to do the crime, old enough to do the time. The boy that killed Joe was a big lad, tall lad. He's not getting punished for what he's done. He's going to be in a cushy prison, you know. They get all perks, don't they? The only thing he's lost is his freedom. We know that it won't bring Joe back. We know it won't give him any longer time inside. Joe was in and out all the time, always hungry, phone out, put something on to eat, Mum. He was in and out like a yo-yo. We used to call him a pain in the backside, really, because he, he was one of these people that you knew he was around all the time. Um, so yes, it's become very quiet in here. Destroyed me. Totally and utterly destroyed me and my family. People like Courtney are working tirelessly to bring an end to the rising knife crime epidemic, taking these knives off the streets. The families that are victims of knife crime, there's nothing that can console them. They're living a nightmare, um, it's, just, it's dreadful for them. We have a family that we support that goes, comes with us to our events and it's heartbreaking. Every time I see them I feel like crying sometimes because you're realising what they're going through and the heartache they're going through, you know. Um, I don't know about the support they get, I don't think they get much support to be honest with you. They support each other as a family. You know, and um, they do the best they can. We try to support them, but how can you support someone whose son or brother has been murdered? You know? I'm just going to open a bin now um, and count the knives. All right, let me not get me mixed up with these knives. Thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty. That's forty knives we've got from Catawba State. Hopefully we've made it a safer place. Every knife crime ruins lives. Politicians line up to condemn it. Big promises are made to fix the problem. But on the streets, the police simply don't have the numbers or strategy to deal with this crisis. And for those touched by the tragedy of loss, all too often they are left alone without the help they need to rebuild their shattered lives.